Yes. Yeah. Hello. Welcome everyone to the Ames Public Library, both in person and online for tonight's program brought to you through a partnership with Ames Public Library and the Ames History Museum. I'm Kathy Cooney. I am an adult services librarian here at APL. The library's mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programming like tonight's event. For those of us in person, this room has an induction loop for the benefit of hearing aid users. To use it, just switch your hearing aid to T. I also have a hearing assistance device available in the back that I can loan you if you would like. Just come see me and I'll set that up for you. For those with us virtually, please submit your questions through the Q&A or chat, which is linked at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll monitor them to make sure they're shared with Teresa. If you get bumped out of the meeting, follow the original link to get back in. And we have also enabled live captioning on our Zoom feed. If you're not seeing captions, you can turn them on by clicking the CC live transcript button and selecting closed captioning. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the History Museum's YouTube channel after the event. You can also find it on the library's website at amespl.org slash history lectures. And I'll put that link in chat for our Zoom folks. We will have time for the questions at the end. If you're here in person, when it comes time for the questions, we ask that you do use the microphone so that the people at home can hear your question too. And we'll run around with the mics and make it easy for you. And Teresa will be available after the presentation if you would like to purchase a book or have her sign your copy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Casey to introduce our speaker. I'm Casey Vance, Executive Director at Ames History Museum. And I just wanted to mention again the great partnership between Ames Public Library and Ames History Museum. We're always pleased to partner with them on um, programs and talks like this. And we're excited to have this one both in person and virtual. Tonight, we're pleased to have with us Teresa Wilhelm Waldoff, author of Wilhelm's Way, the inspiring story of the Iowa chemist who saved the Manhattan Project. Teresa is the world's leading expert on the Ames Project section of the Manhattan Project. An independent scholar, her in-depth research provided for publication of the first ever account of the life of chemist Harley Wilhelm and the critical Manhattan Project work he led on the Iowa State campus. Teresa often speaks on Wilhelm's life and scientific contributions, the Ames Project, and the founding of the Ames Lab. Outside of research and writing, Teresa is a business professional with 30 years experience in management, specializing in process improvements and turnarounds. Teresa holds a BA in speech communications and an MBA from the University of Minnesota. She lives in Rochester, Minnesota with her family. Please join me in welcoming Teresa. Hi, I'm so glad to hear the microphone is working. Great. So welcome, everybody. I want to start out by just talking a little bit about what got me started to work on this project, which was a seven year project. In 1986, they named a building after my grandfather, Dr. Harley Wilhelm, on the Iowa State campus. And my mother and father called me, I was in my 20s, and they said, come to the university, they're naming a building after your grandfather. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's grandpappy, the man who gives me horsey rides on his back when I was little. I had no idea that he was an important figure in American history until I came down. And during the proceedings that day, there was a gentleman from the Department of Energy. His name was Lou Ionello, Dr. Lou Ionello. And he said, that's the only thing I remember from that day. If it weren't for Harley Wilhelm, we'd all be speaking Japanese right now. Oh. Well, that was a little bit of an overstatement because I think we would have won the war anyway. But he, his point was that what Wilhelm did was so critical to the success of the program that it, he wanted to make sure people understood that. So my ears kind of peaked up. I remembered that, but I was in my 20s and I didn't really think much about it after the fact. But as I got older, I heard more stories about my grandfather from my family and started realizing this guy was kind of an important guy. And, you know, what is the story behind this and why don't I know it? Well, it turned out that um, he was a very humble man. And when he died, we were clearing out his closet and there was a shelf in there full of awards. 
And he used to get these awards, bring, home, bring them home, show my grandmother, and put them up on a shelf. And uh, so I really didn't know anything about this. And so I, as I got older, I thought, I need, this is a story. It's our story. It's our history. It's American history. It's world history. And it deserves to be out there. So I spent the next seven years laboring on this book, crying in front of the computer and doing all the research to try and put this book together to make it a book that people could read and enjoy and understand. Because there's chemistry in it, but it's in layperson's terms. And I've tried to weave the family stories in to keep the pace moving and stuff. And I hope those that you've read it can agree that I was able to do that, I pray. Oh, there's a head nodding, there's another one, good, yay. So I succeeded in that anyway. So let's see how this goes. Okay, so how did the Manhattan Project even get started? Well, interestingly, on December 6, 1941, the day before Pearl Harbor, there was a meeting between Nobel physicist Arthur Compton and Vannevar Bush, who was the director for the Office of Scientific Research and Development. And they decided they were trying to get the president to fund more research on nuclear weapons and uranium. Well, they got a little bit of money, but then on December 7th, they got more. <laughs> Surprisingly, more money. And Arthur Compton was put in charge of the project down in Iowa, or excuse me, in Chicago. He was his Nobel laureate, and he started pull pulling together all these different physicists from around the country. And they were having meetings, and they realized they needed a chemist. So he asked around and looked for a chemist that could help, and that chemist was a guy named Frank Spedding, who was at Iowa State. So he called Frank Spedding up, and Frank Spedding was very, very interested in being part of it. And if you read the book, you'll understand his personality and why he wanted to be a part of the book, part of the project. So he, he went up to Chicago for these meetings in January, and during the meetings, it became apparent that they wanted to use uranium to solve this problem of how to get a nuclear chain reaction going. Well, the problem was to do that, they needed pure uranium and it didn't exist. In the 150 years since uranium had been discovered, no one had been able to purify it. In nature, it occurs naturally as a compound. And even if they were able to separate the compounds and get uranium, they needed to make sure there were no impurities in, in there, like other elements or other uh, compounds that would be messing in there because those impurities would kill the reaction. They'd steal neutrons and kill the reaction. Well, this is a major problem because in 150 years since uranium had been discovered, nobody had been able to do it. Compton had Westinghouse working on it, Princeton working on it, Bureau of Standards was working on it, Metal Hydrides is working on it, Westinghouse is working on it, Berkeley was working on it, Chicago's working on it. All these people are trying, really smart people, are trying to solve this problem, how to purify uranium. He is not convinced that that is gonna be successful. So he decides we need to have a substitute for the pure uranium, because I don't think we're gonna have it in time for this experiment that he has planned for December 2nd of 1942. So that was the, the decision to have Spedding's team work on finding a substitute. And Spedding, Spedding's like, I, we can do it down in Iowa. I have a whole team down in Iowa. We can start, get started right away. And Compton agrees to it. Well, Spedding didn't tell him quite everything. There was only two people on that whole team, Wilhelm and Spedding. So, so he came back to Iowa and asked Wilhelm, would you be willing to work on finding a substitute for the project? And Wilhelm says, of course, you know, it's a war. We're going to do whatever we can to be part of the war effort. Now, let me see where I'm at in my pictures. Whoops. Oh, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we all know Los Alamos, and we know Oak Ridge. Those are the two main ones people are familiar with. And Hanford was another really big one, Richland up in the corner there. But right smack in the middle there is Ames. So this started in February of 42 in Ames, Iowa, and it became a true hub of the project. And I'll talk about that more as the program goes on. But there are a lot of sites around the country that were working on the project. But this critical problem of purifying uranium was going to have to be solved in order to move forward with the project. So enter, whoops, did I skip Harley? There we go. Enter Harley Wilhelm. Okay, let me see what I have for my notes. <laughs> okay, so he, he gets going on the project and um, 
they're going to be trying a whole lot of different experiments and he's doing research uh reading all the materials that he's got in the, in the secret library that they have down in the basement of the, of uh what is now gilman hall and he thinks to himself you know what i know i'm supposed to be working on a substitute that's my job i will do it but i'm going to work on trying to solve the real problem that the physicists want they want pure uranium i'm going to solve that too so he went to work on solving that on the side now this was a a lot of problems. I mentioned that Westinghouse was working on this problem, and they had they had a method that actually created pretty good uranium, great uh, rice-sized grains. It wasn't quite pure, but it was really inefficient. They took uranium tetrafluoride and they put it in a calcium chloride bath in big vats, and they took these vats and they put them up on the the roof of their manufacturing warehouse plant in New Jersey. Now we're talking. January, February, March in the winter, right? There's not a lot of sun up there in the winter and it needed sunlight as a catalyst. So they weren't having much success getting anything done. And Wilhelm thought, you know, they're never gonna get what they need <laughs> with the Westinghouse method. And the other thing was that, that Arthur Compton had negotiated the price of $1,000 a pound for production with Westinghouse. That was pretty steep. Um, and so when Spedding and Wilhelm start working on it, they're like, well, we can, we can get the price down if we can solve this problem. We can get the price down. I'll talk about the price a little bit later. Another method was the Metal Hydrites Company, and they used, uh, I always forget, uranium dioxide, and they reduce it with calcium hydride. Are there any chemists in the room? <laughs> okay. You can, you can challenge me when I get the, I'm not a chemist, so. <laughs> so when reduced with calcium hydride, the oxygen atom in brown oxide are attracted to it, which then leaves uranium. So they were getting uranium, but it was impure. It was very big, problematic. It wasn't pure and it was very dangerous. It was explosive, spontaneously explosive. And in fact, this is not the actual truck, but there was a truckload that was going from Missouri, I think, up to Princeton that spontaneously burst into flames. And, and it was very dangerous. And so Wilhelm's like, I don't want to be using that in my process because this is really dangerous. So there were these other people working on it, but they just weren't having the success. And I, so he's searching for a substitute. And one of the other um, potential ones that he was working with was uranium dioxide to see if it could be fused into a solid and they could eliminate this powder. And, and uh, the problem with uranium dioxide is that um, in the 30s and 40s, it was used as a glaze on dishes. So um, if you have Fiesta wear from the 30s and 40s, it's radioactive. <laughs> and I'm not joking. <laughs> and you don't want to be eating off of them because they still are radioactive today, especially if they're red or white. So um, there are problems with the uranium di dioxide. That was not um, something that they could use. Another one was uranium car carbide. And that one, it would become very brittle and it would ad adhere to the containers that they were putting it in. And then once they were able to separate it, if they were able to, it just kind of disappeared. It dissipated up into nothing. So they just didn't have any luck. And so he spends this all spring of 42 working on these different kinds of things. What are we going to use? What are we going to use? Well, he and Spedding started talking about uranium tetrafluoride. And back in his earlier years, Wilhelm had read an article about an experiment by a guy named Henri Moisson, who had had some relative success getting some uranium using uranium tetrafluoride. So he wanted to experiment with that. But before they did that, they had a lot of problems. So there's so little known about uranium. What does it react with? Does it react with air? Does it react with water? Does it um, explode if you heat it up? Does it, uh, can you form it into something? They knew nothing. They didn't know the melting point even of uranium because they never had uranium as just uranium. It was always as a compound. At the end of the project, when the, when the um, uh, patents were done back in the 50s, which is interesting because actually if you look, you can't see it, but up in the top corner, it says February of 1957 is when the patent was actually issued for this casting method that he came up with. 
And he filed it in 1944. It's all classified. So it had to be declassified before he could have this. But they were trying to figure out what can we put it in that it won't stick to or that it won't blow up with. And he invented a casting process in order to be able to form, uh, to have, um, to create the shapes of uranium. Once they had the uranium, they could put it into the shapes that were needed by the physicists and other sites. So he invented this casting system and got the patent on that, along with C.F. Gray, who was uh, one of his uh, um, chemists, PhD chemists that worked for him. The other thing was this thing called a bomb. And I always like to joke um, because he didn't invent the A-bomb, but he invented a bomb. <laughs> so, and, and what it is, is um, they were trying to figure out what could they, what could they um, do these reactions in and have it not adhere to it or stick to it or blow up or um, melt, you know. Well, he um, had this big experiment coming up with the uranium, uranium tetrafluoride that he and Spedding had been talking about they'd wanted to use in an experiment and they needed to get their hands on it. So he directed C.F. Gray to create a bomb. Not the bomb, but a bomb. And it was um, just a metal pipe with a flange welded on the bottom and a screw top. And in that, Wilhelm was going to put uranium tetrafluoride and calcium, and they're gonna line it with lime because you needed to keep that mixture of the uranium tetrafluoride, which is actually called green salt to make it easy to describe. <laughs> green salt, it was that green stuff that I showed you on the Westinghouse, right? Um, they put that in there along with calcium to see what, what they could have happen, but they had to have a protection from the steel pipe because otherwise it would heat up and you'd have a blowout probably of molten stuff coming out at you. So he lined it with that calcium to keep that from reacting. So all summer long, they've been working on the casting. He's been designing this bomb. Finally, Spenning's able to get a little bit of uranium tetrafluoride and bring that back from Chicago with him. Spenning was working up in Chicago this whole time and Wilhelm was running the show here. And if you read the book, there's a lot of things that say that he, I even have a letter that Spedding wrote that you know, Wilhelm was the CEO at all times. So I know that my grandpa was really the guy in charge. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, uh, anyway, he gets his hands on this little piece, little block of uranium tetrafluoride and brings it back to Ames. And Wilhelm grinds it up and he takes that along with some calcium and has um, Keller, Wayne Keller and Gerald Butler put it in the bomb that he's designed, okay? They don't know what's gonna happen though. <laughs> Nobody's ever done this before. Are we gonna blow up the chemistry building? <laughs> Maybe we should do this outside. So they take it outside and they, they put it on, on the courtyard by the chemistry building, which is now Gilman Hall. And Wilhelm, who's very resourceful, and I will say the original recycler, um, he got a champion spark plug to use as the catalyst to get the heat going with a little magnesium to get the heat going to get a thermite reaction going inside that bomb. Okay, so they're out in the courtyard. Now they don't know what's gonna happen. So they scoot around the corner of the building to watch. They, wanna, they don't wanna be in harm's way if that thing blows. And it starts to bounce up and down. They know something's happening in there. For a minute or two, the temperature rises. They have a thermocouple on there with a, to be able to tell what the temperature is, and then it stops. But it's really hot, so they can't open it up. They have to wait hours and hours. Well, finally, it cools down. Wilhelm takes it inside. He unscrews that cap. He takes that bomb. He pounds it on the desk, <laughs> and out falls this mass of not pure uranium. And he thinks to himself, hmm, I wonder, this is this mass here. Maybe there's something inside. We should cut this in two. So he got a saw and he cut it in two. And that's when he spied it. The first pure uranium, 20 grams. It was about this big. And that was August 3rd, 1942. The 80th anniversary was last week. Changed history right here in Ames, Iowa. Not River City, <laughs> right here in Ames, Iowa.
So that was pretty spectacular, this first pure uranium. He couldn't report on it right away, and he needed to um, see if he could get more. You know, he told Spedding that he had it, even showed Spedding, but um, they needed, for their experiment that was coming up in December, they needed 12,000 pounds. <laughs> he had 20 grams, 12,000 pounds. Hmm, how are we going to get there? All right. So this is that, actually, this is the actual record of that experiment that I was able to find in the archives at Iowa State. It's circled in green, uranium metal from fluoride by calcium, Wilhelm Keller and Butler. And this over here is just a sample that's not the actual one. That's just a sample of the biscuits of uranium that they started casting later on. All right, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna back up. I got a lot of stories to tell here now. Okay, so. <clears throat> During this process, and actually really before things got really going in March or April, the plan in the chemistry building was that they were going to build a wall and separate the regular workings of the university from the top secret classified stuff. So they didn't, they didn't have that built yet. And my grandfather used to help out my grandma by bringing the kids to the lab with them on the weekends. So this one weekend he brings to the lab and he had Myrna, that's Myrna right there, and, uh, and Lorna and my dad at the lab. Well, they get into mischief and he, in his lab, he's got this safe and Max and Lorna go over there and they start playing with the safe, seeing if they can get in there. Well, of course they couldn't get in there. So then they run off and they go do something else. Myrna, however, decides I'm gonna try that. And she goes over there and she's playing along with the combination. And all of a sudden Harley hears this giggle. <laughs> he looks up and the safe is open. <laughs> all of the classified documents are in there. From, from that day forward, Myrna has been known as a safe cracker. <laughs> 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 so needless to say the wall that was going to be built got put up pretty darn quick after that. And the kids were not allowed to go to the lab anymore until well after the war is over. So here we are, he's got his 20 grams of uranium and he needs a lot more. Over the next few weeks, he keeps experimenting, trying to increase the quantity of output on each of these experiments that he does. And he makes the bombs bigger and bigger. They finally got to being three foot long and about a foot in diameter. And that was towards when they got into major production. But early on, he just kept making them bigger and you get a little bit more and a little bit more. And it gets to a point where he says, I need to prove to Compton that I can get pure uranium in quantity. And he's getting anxious because the war is going. Men are dying in battle. And every day that goes by, more people are dying. And he says, I got to get to Chicago and show them that I can get quantity. So on September 23rd, 1942, he instructs CF Gray to cast all the miscellaneous pieces of metal that he's got, uranium metal that he's got, into one ingot. And that ingot was 11 pounds. It was about this big. Well, Wilhelm is going to go to Chicago and he's going to take the midnight train. This is like right out of a movie. <laughs> he, he grabs that ingot and it is still warm. So he uses a cloth and he throws it into this briefcase. It is a gift that he'd gotten 20 years later from some students when he left the college that he was coaching where he was a failed coach, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But anyway, he, he throws it into the briefcase, hops in the car, races down to the train station in, in Ames, Iowa, and catches the midnight train to Chicago, going across the prairies with the most valuable thing on the planet, no security, worth $40 million in today's dollars. Well, he didn't, nobody knew what it was, right? So they didn't know he had it, but he slept in bed with it. <laughs> so to keep it safe. Well, the next morning he arrives in Chicago and he walks across the university campus, or first he takes the, the L across town, walks across campus. He goes and finds Frank Spedding and Frank Spedding and he go to Arthur Compton's office. They walk in and Harley Wilhelm takes out that ingot and puts it on Compton's desk. And his eyes bug out and his jaws drop. He's like, I don't believe it. He's never seen anything like that. I don't believe it's pure and I don't believe it's solid. 
Well, Wilhelm knew it was. They he had tested it that was pure, and he knew it was solid because he had invented a process for solidifying metals. See, the problem that, that Arthur Compton, Compton didn't realize was that, well, he knew this was a problem. He cannot just cool metal and, not, and have it be solid. It will form a pipe on the inside. They kind of cool from the inside out. That's what happens with metals. Well, Wilhelm, during that summer, I mean, he had a lot of things going on. You see this list. This is just metallurgy. He was also in charge of the analytical chemistry going on, too. So he had a lot going on. Each one of those represents just one week of experiments, right? But during that summer, he also invented a process for cooling metals that eliminated that pipe or that vacuum on the inside. So he knew it was solid, but Compton didn't. So Compton told him, go to the shop go across the campus, go to the shop, cut it to prove to me it's solid. Well, he did. Cuts it into fire breaks out. <laughs> and well, fire broke out because they cleaned it, uh, CF grade cleaned it with some turpentine right before he left. There were still fumes there. So the, the uh, technician raced across the room, grabs the fire extinguisher, runs over there to put the fire out, and there's nothing in the fire extinguisher, so the fire's still going. So he runs around and gets another fire extinguisher, comes out over, and he's able to put out the fire. Whew. So he gets the fire put out, and sure enough, it was solid. They'd cut it in two, and it was solid. Compton had it sent to several labs. It was tested pure. Another moment that changed history, because that's when they really decided to do things down in Ames. Arthur Compton decided, let's move the whole production stuff down to Ames. Let's do a pilot plant in Ames to see if we can scale up this production. Because I've got 11 pounds now. It's September 24th, October, November, December 1, 2, to 12,000 pounds. 11 pounds, oh boy. So uh, Wilhelm comes back to Iowa, and he spends the next few days looking around all over town. And I talk about it in the book, all the places he's looking for, trying to find a place to, that he can create a manufacturing plant. And mind you, he was a chemist. He was not an operations manager. He didn't know anything about manufacturing or production scaling up. He didn't know any of this stuff, but he just had that brain that could figure this stuff out. He finds a little building on campus that was a leftover building from World War I that had had many different uses, including being the women's gymnasium at one point. And um, he, he goes to the Dean, uh, Dean Gaskill, who was in charge of that building and gets permission to use it. And they start using this building to scale up production and outfit it. And he ended up finding, oh, I can't even go, there's too many things to talk about. They're all in the book, but they end up outfitting it. But there were a lot of fires and explosions. Highly flammable building made out of corn cob wallboard, <laughs> which was a common building material back in those days, in back in the World War I era. So his fire team, his, you know, his, his uh, production workers become their own fire brigade because everything they're working on in that building is top secret and classified. And when the fire trucks come, they don't get to come in. So these guys had to learn how to be their own firemen. And they ended up having like one day, six explosions. And um, in fact, all the secretaries walked out and spending what happened to be around that day. And he was able to convince them to, you know, all but two of them to come back. But um, it was very dangerous work not just because it was uranium, but because it was, you know, they're in a building that was not outfitted to do this because nobody had done it before. They didn't know what you should be doing and not doing. Um, but anyway, they, they, uh, it was exciting times in that building. And there's some other really good stories in the book that talk about what was going on in that building with the guys and the, the dynamics and things like that. So um, they start scaling up production. Well, December 2nd shows up. They don't have 12,000 pounds. They have 4,000. Wilhelm was able to produce 4,000 pounds of pure uranium that was all shipped to Chicago. Well, that's problematic, given that they knew they needed 12,000. So Arthur Compton said, let's do this. Let's put the pure uranium from Wilhelm at the center of the pile. And they were literally building a pile of uranium, uranium they call them eggs, Spedding's eggs, um, and carbon and building this huge pile 
under the stadium in downtown Chicago at the university. Of course, they don't know what's going to happen there either. So um, they're building this up. And they put Wilhelm's uranium at the center of the pile because it's pure. And then they surrounded it with uranium oxide, um, pure as pure as they could get uranium oxide and impure uranium, hoping that if they could get this experiment to go in the pure stuff, it would continue and be successful. Well, we know that it was, right? So but it was interesting that day, Wilhelm, he didn't go, he went to Chicago that for, at the same time, Spedding and he both went to Chicago and Spedding wanted to be part of history and he was there. And Wilhelm thought, you know, this is the physicist deal. <laughs> I'm the chemist. I don't know if they're gonna blow up Chicago. So I'm gonna to go to Michigan. So he, instead of going to Chicago, he came to Chicago, but he got another train, went to Michigan because he needed some, some equipment that was made by a manufacturer in Michigan that could grind up these big pieces of magnesium, that magnesium the size of cabbage that he needed to, to um, reduce in size in order to use magnesium as an alternative to the calcium. So um, he wasn't there that day, but he got the word that it worked. All right, well, for us, fast forward, during the course of that next three years, he and his team produced 2 million pounds of pure uranium. After that experiment, Spedding asked him to start producing 100 to 200 pounds a day in January of 43. And by March, please produce 2,000 pounds a day. I mean, the amazing amount, oh, I have a picture, what best on it? There we go. Here's the picture of the production scaling up that he did in just a few months. And if anybody has ever been in manufacturing and starting out with a new process, this is just remarkable. And um, I just, when I finally did a graph, I'm like, are you kidding me? That's amazing. So he was producing 60,000 pounds a month by March of 43. And it was all pure and it was going off to Los Alamos and 90, or excuse me, to uh, Oak Ridge. 90% of the uranium that was at Go Live for Oak Ridge came from Ames, Iowa. So that was, we really are the ones that got Oak Ridge going. All right, so fast forward, the, the war ends. Um, of course, during this whole time, it's all classified. And of course, my grandma, she knew he was working on something, but we didn't really know what. She didn't know what, just something for the war. And in fact, it was so secret, my grandfather was worried about him giving away secrets because he talked in his sleep. So during the war, he actually slept in a different bedroom for my grandma because it was dangerous because if he, you know, what if they knew something? It was a kidnap risk too. So there's a whole lot of things to be concerned about. Well, the war ends and during the war, there was a thing called the Army Navy ETH. Oh, and I forgot to say. So the day the, the bomb drops, my grandma doesn't know anything about it. Harley calls home. He says, turn on the radio. You'll know what I've been doing the last three and a half years. And that's when she found out that he'd been working on the atomic bomb. Anyway, after the war, in October, General Groves, who was running the project for the War Department, came to Ames. Now, there was an award called the Army-Navy E-Flag. And... It was a flag given to industry for production and hitting production goals during the war. If you had a contract with the government to hit, to make bullets or boots or whatever it was, you had a schedule of production that you had to meet. And if you hit that, the first time you hit it, you got this big flag called the Army-Navy E-flag. Every six months, if you hit that, that goal, you would get a star added to your flag. It was for, for production for um, companies. And there are 85,000 companies eligible to win the award, but only 5% won any flag. Very many fewer got all the stars you could get. Iowa, however, is a university. It's not a company. So should they get a, an award? They were doing production work. Well, Jenner Gross decided they deserved an award. And October 17th, 1945, he came to Ames, Iowa and awarded this flag to Iowa State University. And it had every star on it that they could get. <laughs> Wilhelm never missed a single production goal he was given. It's a phenomenal story. 
All right, a little bit down the road, Ames Laboratory is founded. Co-founders are Wilhelm and Spedding. It is now a world famous lab um, in critical materials. They've done high speed computing. They've done all these wonderful things. And then so cool to, to uh, know that my grandpa was co-founder of that and that it really has done remarkable things for history. And I, I, don't, I can't tell you all of it. You've got to read the articles that they write about it. <laughs> but, but he was the co-founder of it and um, very proud of that. So now we wonder, who is this Harley Wilhelm guy? Where did he come from? Why is he important? And um, I'll tell you what, I look at this photo of him and this is him in the middle. He's about six years old here. He was born in Southern Iowa, Ringgold County on a farm outside Elston, Iowa in 1900, August 5th, 1900. He would have been 122 last week. I look at that picture, I think, that kid's gonna change world history? <laughs> you can tell he's from meager means. I mean, look at his jacket and his clothes are all dirty and messy. Uh, he went to a one-room schoolhouse. so where he started his education, Pump Town School. He never knew why they called it Pump Town School though, because there was no pump. He was out in the country. They had to walk to the nearest farm to get water. And he didn't know why they called it Town School because it was out in the country. So it's Pump Town School. He always said, I don't know why they call it. There's no pump, no town, but I'll tell you what. He was so proud of his humble beginnings that his gravestone says, boy from Pump Town on it. <laughs> the boy from Pump Town. So basketball bounces into town in about 1910 and he learns how to play and he is a phenom. His big brothers teach him how. And in eighth grade, he was so good. I was able to find these articles online from 1914, a game where he scored every point, right? And then he was so good that in eighth grade, he ended up on the varsity team and he was on varsity all through high school. He was the, they had sportscasters all over Iowa coming to see him play. And what happened was a, when he was a senior in high school, a tournament in Ringgold County, it was the first, I think it was the first ever Ringgold County tournament took place. And he was on fire. The referee was a coach from Drake. And he's like, who is this kid? He was the assistant coach at Drake. He went back and told the head coach about this kid he saw playing down at Ringgold County. And like, we, we got to get this kid to come play at Drake. Well, after having the conversation, there was another uh, a basketball player standing there in the conversation. His name was Ted Long. And he goes, I know him. I grew up in the area. I know the Wilhelms. He's a really smart kid. You should get him to come here. And so they, um, they approached him and asked if he would come. He goes, he had no intentions of going to, high, going to college. In fact, it was a miracle he graduated high school. His two older brothers didn't. They dropped out. His sister didn't. He was the only one in his family that did. And, um, but he, he said, okay. So he's going to try it. But to get into college, he had to take entrance exams. Well, Elston High School is unaccredited. So they're pretty sure he's going to not pass those entrance exams. And he arrives that day to go and take those entrance exams. And there's a proctor who's going to check and make sure he doesn't cheat. And this proctor is a woman that's actually his age. Her name is Orpha. And um, she notices he's pretty cute. <laughs> he's got curly blonde hair, blue eyes, farm boy, athlete, muscular, you know. And then she sees his scores. <laughs> it's like, he's smart too. And um, they got to be friends throughout, throughout college, but they really didn't date until they were seniors. And she ended up being my grandma. So he did pretty darn good on those um, entrance exams and he got into Drake. Well, his career at Drake started out pretty poorly. He had, uh, he was playing on the football team. He didn't ever play football really before that. And in basketball, he wasn't doing well either. And that was his sport. And he figured out it's because the baskets were higher in college than they were in, at high school. So he didn't look like he was any good. And then the end of the season that, you know, the end of the year is coming and the coach is like, I'm going to cut this kid. He's really not any good. Well, what happened earlier in the year was during a physics class, the regular professor was gone that day and the dean of the college at Drake, Dean Morehouse, was substituting and he was working a problem on the board and he got stuck. Well, Wilhelm at his Pumptown school had, 
And in while Elston had been used to going up and solving problems on the board. So he just hopped up, went to the front of the room and solved the problem. <laughs> and this professor's like, wow, this kid's pretty smart. Well, when it came time to eliminate him, there was this conversation between the coaches. Well, the dean was there and he says, whoa, this, I think this kid is pretty smart. Let's give him another year. And he got to stay in school. And of course, the next year, he had breakout year in basketball. And he ended up having really great years all through, all through college in basketball. He became known as the tornado. He was the junior or the captain of the basketball team in his senior year. He was so well liked by everybody. He was college class president, senior class president. And then his senior year at the end of the year, Drake finally got admitted into Phi Beta Kappa and he was a charter member of Phi Beta Kappa at Drake. Proved out he was kind of smart too, not just a good athlete. And so um, he had a really great career in, in college and he thought, oh, I'm gonna be a coach and teacher. He took all the math and science that he could take, went off to be a coach and teacher, had a pretty good year at Mapleton, had a, took a year off to go to take more classes at Drake. Then he had a great, pretty good year at Guthrie Center and says, I'm gonna go be a college coach. So he grabs my grandma with her newborn baby and they move up to Montana. So he's going to be this college coach at Intermountain Union College in, in Montana. And it was a disaster. I mean, this guy, he thought he could be this great coach and he gets up there and the football team had really not played, um, high, uh, played football in high school. And the field was filled with all these rocks. They had to get all the kids to come together to clean up the field so they could play and not get injured. They lost every game. Okay, but basketball is next and that's his sport. The problem is they didn't have a gym to practice in. <laughs> and they got to practice a couple times in the gym across town. And he was teaching this kid, this team how to, how to solve problems or how to do the plays on paper. And as the season just was going to get underway, a spinal meningitis outbreak happened and the health department shut everything down. So he missed the whole first half of the season. Finally, they get to start up the season and they get going. He's like, we're going to do great. And they lost every game. <laughs> and he finally realizes, you know, I'm a better player than coach. <laughs> I'm going to go back and get my PhD. And that's when he ended up going back to Iowa and coming to Iowa State and getting his PhD in chemistry. He was doing pretty good here, you know, doing research and teaching. He came up with a lot of classes. I do talk about that in the book about the different classes he developed for the chemistry department and different things. He solved a major problem with dental fluorosis in the water in Ankeny, um, which is kind of cool because the health department at the time was under the guise of, uh, under the control of University of Iowa but we solved it at Iowa State. So that was pretty good. Um, and just kind of going along and then he gets invited onto the Manhattan Project. So it's a pretty neat story. It's a pretty inspiring story. Now, you remember earlier I was talking about this Army Navy E flag that Iowa State got. Well, the thing about that was General Groves, who was running the project for the Manhattan Project, understood the importance of what Wilhelm did and he, that day, whoop, here we go, took Wilhelm aside and gave him his own flag. <laughs> the only person on the... My grandpa, as I've mentioned, was very humble. He took that home, showed my grandma, and put it up on that shelf. <laughs> Or it stayed for over 40 years until Spedding died because he didn't want to outshine oh, Spedding. Okay, so great story. Um, humble beginnings, perseverance, intelligence, uh, just a fun grandpa. And that's really my story. And I hope that you buy the book. I hope you read the book. Tell everybody about the book. I need to sell books. So, um, <laughs> so um, this is where you can buy the book. You can buy it at wilhelmsway.com, teresawaldoff.com, which are the same website. They just go there. Or Amazon. It is on Kindle if you don't want an actual book. Um, or any of your favorite bookstores can order it in too. Um, the, uh, if you order from my website, 
you know, if you don't buy one tonight, which I hope everyone does, but if you don't and or a friend wants to buy one, they can get a signed copy by going to my website. So I would like to, I would like to do two things. I want to show you, if you're interested, that Army Navy E-Flag award that he got. Would you like to see that? Okay. Come on up, family. And then we'll open it up for questions. The other way. Here we go. <laughs> okay, great. So now I am open for questions. Thank you. Yes. You've been on campus, so you know where that rock is that says this is where Little Ankeny was? Yes, yes. There is a, a little marker. You know, Little Ankeny existed for a few years afterward, and um, they were mostly using it for storage. And in 1953, they decided to tear it down. And at that point, my grandpa said, you know, right now it's more radioactive than active. So let's go ahead and it's okay to tear that down. Yes. I lived across the street from the Lankany oh. when I was a kid. And my dad, it was a big, tall, 18-foot story building with a 8-foot uh, second level. And we lived there. And then when the guys came back after the war, they, there were four other houses on the, right in the right. And they looked like houses. This I can see it in my mind. I've never been able to find a picture of it. I was not in Ames when they tore it down and put the gym there. And the, my dad walked past that every day. And he kept saying, you know, there's something funny about that train. It <laughs> goes out empty. Okay, I shall tell the story of the train. So on the Iowa State campus, there's a, a railroad spur that goes on the campus. And they had to get that uranium off campus somehow. And there's actually a really cute, they would come in and go out and it was so heavy, they could only put one layer of uranium on the, on the bottom of the train cars. But there's another really good story that goes along with that. So um, at one point, um, all of the waste materials that come out of the, when you're separating uranium off the uranium, but then you got the fluoride and the other, and the uh, other ingredients, calcium and stuff. So they had to get rid of that slag and they were dumping it all on the dump, in the dump on campus. And the government finally said, we need to dig that up and send it out east. Well, we'll <laughs> we want it out east. They're going to refine it there and try and get in more, you know, some remnant uranium out of it. So they asked, they're trying to say, well, what are we going to put this stuff in to ship it out? Well, Wayne Keller, who was one of the chemists that was on the August 3rd experiment, said, you know, I'm from Kentucky and they got whiskey barrels down there. Let's get some used whiskey barrels and use those to, to ship the, the, uh, the slag back. And so these start arriving and they're filling them up and then they go out. But Wilhelm noticed that anytime that those barrels arrived empty, he had a lot of volunteers to unload them. <laughs> And it turned out that if you took that barrel and you tilted it just the right way, you could get about a cup of whiskey. <laughs> and, and Jack Boyd, who I was able to interview, who is one of the production workers who was still alive when I started the project, he told me that he and the roommates that he, I think it was five other guys lived together that worked on the project. At one point, they had 12 gallons of whiskey. <laughs> so I say there were some good times that took place, even when they were working 24-7. <laughs> so other questions? Movie rights? I have not. I don't, I don't know how to write a screenplay. I don't want to pay a screenplay. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. I got to have somebody help me. Send me in, send me some information, people, <laughs> to help me do that. Aaron, but Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin. Okay. So I do think, you know, it would make a great movie when you see, when you read the book and you see these things happening in your head, you're just like, oh my gosh, you can just see it. And it's, and it's inspiring. And you just, you, uh, yeah. Yeah. I can see Little Italy in my... You know, Little Ankeny? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just across, there was a the house and then this blank 
yard that Daddy built a 12 foot tall slide for the three of us to go down. And I can remember going up the hill on the sidewalk that's still there, thinking, oh, this is the biggest hill. And I came back when I was in college and it hardly was a book. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that was right. Uh, the railroad was right there and the building was there. And mother worried her whole time that all three of us would die of cancer, but nobody had cancer. That's good. That's good. Questions? Yes. How did they handle Next. radiation Next. safety? <laughs> but, nah. <laughs> they, they, they really didn't know. Um, they did start wearing masks and they had a filtration system that they put into little Ankeny or it's these great big bags that were sucking the air in, mainly because there was uranium floating around and they wanted to get that uranium um, you know, coalesced together so that they, they could reuse it. Um, but no, it was not um, really addressed. You know, it got better over time and after the war, you know, in Ames Lab and all that, then they learned all about what they needed to be doing, but they didn't know anything about uranium, really. Um, he also worked with beryllium and thorium and cerium and all these other radioactive things. So, yes. I heard that uh, one of you girls went to some sorority in Ames. Uh, my daughter oh, was right. the same sorority. So one of his daughters? Yeah, one of your daughters, I guess. So I don't know. So I don't know. Were you guys in sororities? He's asking if one of us, one of the daughters were in a sorority in Ames? That's right. A sorority in Ames? Okay. I'm sorry? One of Wilhelm's daughters went to a sorority there. Well, I was in a sorority, but I was at Minnesota. So I don't know. I'm a Chi Omega. So, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Teresa, I've always been curious Hi, about... Kathy. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> um, I've always been curious about where the ore came from and, and how it arrived and in what form. Did, did you find anything I, out about that? You know, no. <laughs> um, you know, there was coming from Canada yeah. and Colorado yeah. and, of course, Sanji's stash in New York that he had in the warehouse there. But I don't know if it was coming by truck or rail. I don't really know how it was coming. I know it's it's one of those things I have not been able to track yeah. down. I mean, you think was were there big piles of rock coming in? I mean, I've always been curious about that. That's been kind of the, the yes. missing link. Yeah, especially yeah. with the magnesium that's coming in the size of cabbage and stuff. And you know, who knows what I'll come across. I I keep kind of poking around looking for stuff. So uh -huh. who knows? I might have to write an yeah, another <laughs> couple chapters later on, on that one. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. Is your grandfather buried at the Iowa State Cemetery? Yes. That's and um, in, you know, his fashion, it is a very small stone. It's flat, small, but it does say the boy from Pumptown on it. My grandmother is buried there also. Yeah. He's right inside the entrance there. Yes. Yes. A question from online. Um, did your grandfather ever talk to you about his work directly? You know, not the work so much as he would use terms like he would talk about tube alloy. I didn't know what he was talking about. Well, that was a code name that was used for uranium during the, the Manhattan Project. Um, all I knew was that he went and did a lot of experiments. <laughs> He was always at the lab. I didn't know what he was doing at the lab, but he was at the lab. And, and so he really didn't. But um, he did write a um, paper on the founding of Ames Lab, which was one of my sources and how it all got started. It was a really valuable source for me um, for getting going on that piece of the book. Here's a tough one. I'm sure you get asked a lot. When people say the bomb costs too many lives and should not have been used, what's your response? Well, um, gosh, you know, war is not pretty, is it? And we were um, invaded and, and bombed by the Japanese and we were, you know, trying to save our country. <laughs> the research I've done and looking at how many lives people who died during the bomb, during the atomic bombs, it's interesting that even just a few months earlier in March, bombing in Tokyo in 24 hours killed as many people. I mean, their people were going to be dying because it was a war. 
The main difference is that this time it ended the war. And we did not have to invade Japan because we had these bombs. We were in aircraft carriers on the coast of Japan ready to invade. And if you read the book, there's actually a letter in there that I came across just a couple of years ago from a guy who was on an aircraft carrier ready to invade. And he says, I had it written in my diary. This is the day I'm going to die. And he didn't, he didn't die. He ended up working for five presidents. <laughs> um, so the other thing is that there are millions of Japanese people living today that would not be living if we had invaded because they would, their families would have been slaughtered. You know, those millions of people would have died if we had not dropped the bomb and, and their, you know, their ancestors would have been wiped out. And so the people living today, as horrible as having that bomb be used, it ended the war and it made, you know, the future possible for many millions of people. Yes. It's appropriate that today's the anniversary of Nagasaki. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what's the basis of the name Manhattan Project and how did Iowa State, way out here in the boonies, get involved in it? So um, the Manhattan Project, it wasn't called that during the war. Um, it was the Manhattan, Manhattan Engineering District. And the Manhattan Engineering District was a, a district for the engineering core, the U.S. Corps of Engineers, based in Manhattan. And it was really the purchasing department because the actual project work when it started was in Chicago. And when Wilhelm got involved, you know, in spedding from Ames, you know, Compton decided to have this work down, done down in Ames because we had um, a furnace. <laughs> they, he had ordered, they were in the process of, they were gonna build a new um, building on campus at University of Chicago where they thought they were gonna be doing all this work. And the furnace, because we're months out. And one of the things Spedding said is we have a furnace in Ames. We can actually start working on that and scaling up production in Ames. And so we agreed to do that on the condition that everybody would move to Chicago when the laboratory was set up. But Wilhelm's work was so successful, they're like, keep going, just keep going. And they did, they kept going for years. And then eventually Wilhelm's team taught the, the other companies, industry did take over um, and, and I think they stopped production in, I can't remember, 44 or 45 of uranium at Iowa State. And uh, it was done by um, industry and Wilhelm's team taught the, them their process, which is called the Ames process. So, and that's the way it's called that throughout the world of uh, nuclear everything. Cause I've had people say, oh, that's the Ames process. I had some guy and I was at a, at a graduate's class reunion thing and this guy who, came to Iowa State, he goes, oh, that's the Ames process. I'm like, the Ames pro yes, <laughs> it's the Ames process. So yeah, other questions, yes. I heard some stories, some of them that uh, your grandfather carried uh, pure uranium around in his pocket all the time. Plus, Spenny also carried some uh, pure stuff around with him. And I'm sure that both of them did. I know that my father or my grandfather did. In fact, he used to bring stuff home and he would set it by the door and tell the kids stay away from the door. So yeah, he 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 had that original ingot, you know, part of that original ingot, a cropping off of that for, for many years. I think it ended up at Ames Laboratory. But yeah, he well, you know, and he's working with uranium, they're grinding it, getting it into the shapes that they needed to use it in. So it's in the air, it's in his hair, it's in his on his person and clothing and everything as he's coming home. So he's generally probably a radioactive guy, not just active, radioactive. <laughs> yes. Um, how many people at Iowa State worked for the Manhattan Project? Well, that's a good question because I've read things that have said 500 people, up to 500 people. My lists of people don't add up to that. So there might be other lists that I don't know about. But it's been said 500 people in some of the different sources that I've come across. But I do have the like original list in the Manhattan District history that has all the names of the people and the dates that they worked. Yes. Yes. So Harvey Wilhelm made a terrific breakthrough. He did what nobody else had done. He made uranium pure. The question is, has that been the method ever since? Yes. 
there's never been a, a yes. another, another new method. No, so no. We still use the well found procedure. Yes. To make pure uranium. Yes, it's 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 very interesting because think about this. How many things are we doing the same way we did 10 years ago? We, you know, our lives have changed so much so fast. And yet with this process, it was so elegant and refined that it's still being used today. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Is the uh, laboratory location in Gilman, in the Gilman basement still in existence? Can, can you see it? it? They did not save it as a historical site or anything. And I personally have not been in there. So I always go to Wilhelm Hall. <laughs> so the, the building that was named after my grandpa is Wilhelm Hall, and that was the metallurgy building, which was built after the war. So um, the Ames are uh, the Manhattan Project ends. The Atomic Energy Commission is formed. The Ames Lab is formed. They get money funding to build two buildings: the metallurgy building and the research building. One is now Wilhelm Hall, and one is Spedding Hall. And I usually go to Sp Wilhelm Hall, and then I go to Spending Hall and look at the Ames flag because the the Ames Iowa State flag is on display at Spending Hall. Yes, it's part of uh, when we go by Ontario, 13th Street. There's this uh, one of the signs says that it's part of the Oak Ridge Lab now. No, it's Ames National Laboratory. No, it's part of the Department of Energy. And it's not affiliated with Oak Ridge. Well, it's affiliated because Oak Ridge is also a national laboratory. Yep, and they're all under the auspices of the Department of Energy. And there's Idaho National Laboratory. There's a whole bunch of national laboratories now. Yes. You mentioned the price uh, early oh. on, and the price got much lower. How much lower? Was yes. It? Okay. So when Compton negotiated uh, this hundred or thousand dollars per pound price, Spedding thought, well, we could get that down to twenty-two dollars a pound, and then they we're working on it and they go, well, maybe we can get it down to even $9 a pound. And then they worked on it some more and they got it down to a dollar a pound for the production, pro for the process of producing it. Remarkable. Yeah. Yes. I got a uh, story I wrote some years ago about, I was interested in the Manhattan Project. I don't know. Stuff in there oh, thank you. Okay, I'll read that later. Yeah. I'll keep it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I don't know how many pounds they use. So there's two bombs. There was the uranium bomb and the plutonium bomb. So the uranium bomb used U-235. The plutonium bomb used uranium that had been transmuted into plutonium. And that's what they used. And they needed that pure uranium to transmute it into plutonium. But I don't know. I didn't memorize that. <laughs> <laughs> That's one fact I haven't memorized. Yes. Were there any spies in the area while your grandfather was working? That's a good question because I, there was a story that I heard in the family how there were some Japanese people that came to town and they were demonstrating yo-yos and that they were spies, supposedly spies, but I don't know. And then there was a kid that lived across, a family, a German family that lived across the street from the Wilhelms. And the adult son that lived there watched the Wilhelm house a lot, but we don't know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did your grandfather just produce the metal or did he separate out the separate isotopes? Like he did not do the isotope separation. That was done in Oak Ridge. Yeah, good question. That's a big difference because, you know, people will tell me that they, uh, he purified the uranium. He did not do the, uh, there's another term where I can't think of it, isotope separation. Yeah, he did not do that. Yeah. They couldn't do that without the pure uranium, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Are you aware of any of our enemies, the Germans or the Japanese, working on nuclear fission? Well, yeah. So during the war, they were very concerned because they believed the Germans were working on it. They were working on it. They weren't having much success. And in 1939, that's when we found out that the Germans had uncovered fission. You know, they figured out that fission exists. And that's when the scientists in the U.S. got very concerned and started pressing and wanting to get more research going on. But the president was reluctant to put much money into it. Um, so it wasn't until really, you know, Pearl Harbor that the money and the funding got really pushed into the project, which ended up being, I think, a couple billion dollars. 
So, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.